Hello, welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth and he's Zog. Hello. And uh, it's just the two of us for this episode. And it's going to be a short episode, this one, because we're going to do our winter fest, whatever you want to call it, Christmas festival episode in one week's time. Hey, I call it Festivus. That would be good. How about that? <laughs> okay, it'll be the Festivus <laughs> episode. I'll get festivus. a shiny metal pole for you and we'll, they, we'll air grievances you. and all that. Yeah, we'll do that. Good, we'll do that. Good. And also next week, um, we've got a, quite a big quiz and a couple of uh, ideas and a brand new Christmas song for 2023 so lots to look forward to but right now hey let's look back zog you and me at the 2023 f1 season because now is the winter of discontent you know we're gonna have to wait a good few months actually not that long really before the start of the next season but overall zog did you enjoy f1 2023 I did, and I enjoyed it, I think, much more than maybe I should have done or I should have expected to do, you know, given how predictable the result of both championships was and the result of almost every race was. You know, Red Bull and Max all the way, you know, so many records this year. What was it? Was there, was there, was there, was there, well, there were 22 races, and he won 19 of them. Uh, most wins, most points, most podiums, most laps led, most consecutive wins, and most hat tricks in a single season. Wow! Yeah, that shows the extent of you know the dominance of Verstappen in the Red Bull, and yeah, he was incredible. The team knocked it out of the park with that car. So, yeah, given how absolutely dominant they were, yeah, I found the season you know, re- remarkably entertaining much more than it should have been because we had enough action. I guess for me, I, I, you know, I've, I've kind of written off the championship you know, very early on. And so it's all about how other drivers and teams are going to do. And there was some real to and fro there, you know, Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren, Aston Martin, you know, were all resurgent and then struggling at different times of the year. What do you put so, that down to? Why Why do you think some teams did exceptionally well at some races and then were nowhere elsewhere? But I have a theory. I, I think it's because they weren't completely on top of understanding their car. And often when they got to the circuit, oh yeah, we were quicker than we were expecting. You hear that? Oh, well, we weren't as quick as we were expecting. There seems to be a lack of understanding of the new aero rules, even after two or three seasons now, two seasons. And that is giving us the unpredictability. That's that's my theory. I, yeah, I'm sure you're right. That there's, there's That's definitely an element of it. And that's part of, I guess, a, a bigger picture of... You know, Formula One being hard. It is very hard to make a fast, reliable car, <laughs> which is what you need to do to, to get anywhere in the sport. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's very, very hard to do that. And when you have yeah a set of new rules that clearly teams understood uh, or had a better ability to adapt to going into this era of, ground effect coming back and you know more downforce from the ground effect and less less from the wings you know red bull absolutely aced it mercedes had real trouble out of the starting blocks they've got on top of it but it took them a while and it was a a painful literally in the driver's case process yeah yeah it's hard it's very hard and and it's you know very hard to do it well all the time and teams hardly ever do that even Red Bull doesn't get it right all the time. They got it right. Um, well, Max got it right 86.3% of the time, winning 19 out of 22 races. Actually, more than that, Red Bull had a higher hit rate than that because Perez won a race, didn't he? And the only non-Red Bull to win a race was Carlos, Carlos Sainz, Sainz yeah. in Singapore. Yeah, That's right, yeah. yeah. But regarding the um, aero rules, I was reading something yesterday an analysis of how the teams are getting on top of the new era of ground effect. And they've realised, the FAI FAI have realised, or F1 has realised, that many teams are 
clawing back downforce as much as 10 or 12 percent over 2022. And the result of that is that the cars are now producing more disturbed air in the wake than they did in the 2022 season. So we're kind of tripping back to how we were before, where it was very hard to overtake the car in front because Mm. of that wake. And here's my thought. If that is the case, I wonder if teams are considering making their car generate a bigger wake in order to prevent teams behind them, cars behind them, from overtaking there is an advantage to be found there isn't there there is and now that you you know raise that question i'd be surprised if that hasn't been part of the thinking of yeah. uh, you know some designers for for quite a while because yeah of course this is if this is something that um makes it harder for the car behind to pass you you'd be crazy not to look into that you know yeah 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 okay sure that's gonna it's gonna make it for your teammate behind you to to either follow or or to pass you if necessary but your teammate is you know one out of 20 odd drivers you're more worried about the other 19 you know it's it's worth making it hard for the other 19 even if you're making it hard for your you know your your one guy so um yeah yeah i'd I'd, I'd be surprised that hasn't been part of the thinking already let's uh, talk about teammates Max did exceptionally well. Perez managed to finish second in the end, almost by the skin of his teeth. Fair play. And Max wouldn't be too worried about his car producing a bit more of a wake to keep Perez behind him. He's the nearest thing that we've had to a threat to Max this year. Why do you reckon Perez couldn't match Verstappen for pace this year? He just doesn't have you know, Max's raw speed, I think, yep. you know, it's, a, who you know, who does? Yeah, um, yeah, good point. I think, you know, he, yeah, yeah he's, he's just, he, he just doesn't have quite the ability. Perez is great. I'm a, I'm a Checo fan, but he is not as quick as Max. He's also older and, you know, he doesn't have that sweet spot of ambition and, uh, you know, a younger body and reflexes and everything that's going on there that can give Max that little bit more of an edge. Mm. And confidence. I think it comes from confidence. I was going to come on to that. Yeah, this is also part of the story. Absolutely. Yeah, because Max has won so many, he expects to be able to win. And it's a psychological game, isn't it? Well, and, and he also, Max, has the belief the team is very much behind him, backing him up and Mm. will, you know, do what it takes to support him. Perez probably doesn't feel that to the same extent. And they're probably both right in thinking that, you know, Mm. if Red Bull have to favour one driver over the other or or, or give one a bit of leg up, it's it's going to be Max. He is the number one driver there. So, given that, Z, if you were going to put any other driver presently on the grid or in the uh, standby lineup in the second Red Bull, which driver would stand the best chance of matching or passing Max? Probably Leclerc, I think. Interesting. I think, I don't know, um, Orlando. Yeah, really? Both over Lewis, you'd say? (sighs) Hard, isn't it? Did I say that? Did I say that? It's tough. Yeah. I think it would be one of the three L's, Lando, Lewis or Leclerc. I think they're the... um, (laughs) they're the three who I'd put, you know, if we're looking at who's most likely to mount a challenge to Max next year, it's going to be one of the three L's. Um, Mm -hmm. Probably. We had a little chat about this the other day on WhatsApp, didn't we? And Mm. uh, you're quite bullish about Ferrari's chances. Yeah. Ferrari doing well. You know, I think it's going to, I'm sure it's going to be Leclerc rather than Sainz that will be leading that challenge. You know, notwithstanding the fact that Sainz was the driver that won the race this year. I think Leclerc is just that little bit better. I think it would be Leclerc that would lead the challenge. But I don't I I don't have the same confidence that you have in Ferrari's ability to pull it together for next year. I think Vasseur's doing a good job at leading the team and they've got two terrific drivers, but I, I I'm skeptical that they're gonna pull it together. Whereas I think McLaren 
show all the signs, you know, to me of being on that path that means they're going to be a strong challenger next year. So I think I think Lando's going to be, I think, yeah, probably Lando's my pick to probably challenge Red Bull. I'm not quite sure that Mercedes are on that same, you know, better development path. We'll see. We'll come to our forecast for the 2024 season in a bit more detail okay. a little bit later on. Yeah, I really want to discuss that with you. But let's get back to 20... I asked you a question, a leading question about Can the we... future. It's my fault. But let's come back to 2023. The only person to win a GP not in a Red Bull, as we said, was Carlos Sainz in Singapore. Perez won in Saudi and Azerbaijan. Perez has driven through the field really well. He's had a couple of races, a number of races where he's been down the field for one reason or another. And he's always managed to make that fine car work to get, you know, within reach of the podium, if not on the podium. You know, he's great at working through the field. It's just that, I think you're right, that ultimate speed. He doesn't quite match Max. And you and I have both experienced this. You know, when we go karting together, yeah. when we do these pro-celebrity karting things, we are all in exactly the same kart, more or less, in terms of performance. And yet there are people who weigh the same as us, who seem to be going at least 50% faster. Yeah, us. I think they are obviously cheating. There is, it, it's inconceivable, inconceivable that, that, that anybody on a, on a kart track uh, might be a lot faster than me. Can't work out how that happens. No idea. <laughs> All right, let's go through the rest of the field. We've dealt with Max, we've dealt with Perez. Lewis's season, oh my gosh. Lewis finished third in the championship in the end. Mercedes finished second in the championship. Lewis got three second places, three thirds and one retirement and one disqualification from the USA Grand Prix due to the ride height thing that him and Leclerc were both disqualified for. So Lewis had a season from hell. And if you listen to the tone of him in the interviews after every race he was more often very down than optimistic wasn't he not a great season for Lewis no but um I mean talk about his tone I I I felt that obviously he was you know disappointed with the way the season went although I dare say they weren't expecting that much going in Mm. but no I, I, I I think he had a fairly you know positive forward looking reasonably upbeat tone a lot of the time to me. It seems like he was you know, looking ahead to the point where Mercedes will have a better car with which he can challenge. And, you know, I think he, he's he, he he's definitely still up for that. Mm. He must be running out of time in the sense that, you know, the, the window in which he is still going to be quick enough to win a world championship is, you know, that... that the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking on on him still having the speed. Mm. Mercedes are off the pace, and okay, they they came they came second in the championship this year, which slightly I think flatters their um, performance. Slightly flatter, flatters them in terms of yeah where they really stand. Mm. Uh, you know they are going to have to step it up and develop well to actually be able to challenge Red Bull significantly next year. So yeah, I don't know. I think it's going to be. It's going to be tricky, but I, I'd love it if Lewis was able to challenge next year. But credit to Lewis, and this says something about how how good he still is. I mean, he pretty solidly beat Russell throughout most of the season, and you know we we know Russell is a is a star. Yeah. You know, maybe he's been struggling a little bit with the car this year, but the fact that Lewis has had the measure of his extremely talented young hotly tip teammate. Um, I think that says he's still got it. Yeah, I think Russell's good for Lewis. I think Russell is pushing Lewis. I mean, I think Lewis always launches into his work with exacting preparation and utter commitment. But the fact that Lewis actually was bettered by Russell in 2022, and yet Russell failed to clobber Lewis this year is good. I was also reading that when they were deciding on the replacement for Bottas, Lewis campaigned hard against having George Russell 
in the team. He wanted to keep against Bottas. Yeah, against. Yeah, oh, he okay. wanted to keep Bottas for one more year because Bottas was compliant, and mm. Lewis described him as the best teammate ever, which is one of the greatest insults you can get in Formula One, isn't it? Really. Well, I mean, I, I know what you mean because obviously the implied dig in a pop or part of the you know subtext of that is it's somebody that I don't think is going to beat me. Yeah. You know, yep. uh, it's somebody that, uh, that that I know I can consistently beat. Then again, if you're Lewis Hamilton, you know, a couple of years ago, you know you can beat anybody all of the time. Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. you know, it's uh-huh. really, I mean, even if there's a bit of an implied dig there, I, I think Bottas is big enough to take it. During the 2023 season, there were two races, Hungary and Monza. I find it really hard to remember what happened at each race with so many races this year and the sprint. It all blurs. But I was reading into it and there was um, an experiment at those two races where they described it as the alternative tyre regulation. So instead of having 13 sets of tyres over the weekend, the teams were only allocated 11 sets of tyres per car Mm. and that made it a bit harder for them to manage tires during the race and get the ultimate performance and some teams decided to use up those tire credits you might describe them as that during qualifying in order to you know make sure they're in a good starting position but it didn't seem to make much difference and i'm not sure if they're going to extend that experiment in 2024 which suggests it was a failure or it was inconclusive. I'm not certain. Well, although there are other things they haven't confirmed for next year in terms of format, such as how many sprint races there are going to be. So it may just be that the fine detail of how different weekends are going to be run is still being worked out. Because, I I mean, I I, I, I don't think there's any real question that sprint races are still going to be part of the calendar next year. I don't mm-hmm. think there's any suggestion that, that, that they're suddenly going to be off the menu, that we're not going to have any sprint races, but they haven't confirmed how many and where yet, I think. So, yeah, I think I think it's part of that same picture. There was some great overtaking action during the season this year. There were some brilliant moments. I had a quick look at a compilation of some of them. <laughs> One that stood out was a lunge from Magnussen, of all people, taking Sargent, arguably not the most difficult person to pass, but this was at Monaco. And Magnussen, as they say, sent it right up the inside, choked him off, and that was glorious. Alonso, early in the season as well, was on fire and then towards the end of the season he was rocking wasn't he he was i mean he had a, no i mean alonso has had a terrific season we've talked many times about you know yep. alonso 2.0 and what a huge fan i am of alonso 2.0 having not been such a fan of alonso 1.0 yeah it's a shame that aston weren't able to make more of that car in the latter part of the season because with the performances that old man Alonso has been putting in, you know, oldest man in the field, won his championships years ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, he won his championships so long ago that I think there'll be a decent portion of new F1 fans yeah. brought on by Drive to Survive who've never even saw Alonso drive in his championship years. So credit to Superstar Alonso for putting in the performances he had all season and shame on Aston Martin for not giving him a better car. Let's hope they can give him a bit more next year. Alonso found himself racing Lewis on a number of occasions during the season. It seems that the equation that is Lewis in the 2023 Mercedes is equivalent in terms of performance to Alonso in the 2023 Aston Martin. And they shared an awful lot of track time, the same piece of track for a lot of the season. Uh, I'm not sure where it was. It was somewhere in the Middle East, but I remember there was a, a section of about I don't know, four or five laps where Lewis and Alonso were trading places and racing quite hard, but yeah. respectfully. They had a very good scrap, I remember that. Yeah. Also, there have been several races where I kept thinking, that's Alonso and Lewis. Which one's which? Those <laughs> cars do look awfully similar head on under those lights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, those cars could be hard to tell apart. Okay, Zog, here's one for you. Of all the drivers on the grid, without looking it up, take a guess, yeah. which one 
had the most retirements in 2023? Who would you say? Interesting. Oh, okay. I, I'm, my, my first thought is to say Leclerc, which I say because just because I happen to know that he <laughs> he set a rather unfortunate record this year. He was the first driver, I think, in a single season to have. A DNF did not finish, yeah. DNS did not start, and DNQ did not qualify. Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're right, he did endure all those unfortunate incidents, but the answer to who had the most retirements is Ocon, Esteban Ocon, who had six retirements. I thought it was going to be oh, that's a shocker. Logan Sargent for one reason or another, but we had some amazing lunges for the line. This year, I think there were three or four occasions where the decision as to who got there first was taken almost within two metres of the line. Alonso at one point, Perez at one point, and unbelievably, even Lance Stroll did a lunge for the line and benefited it in one race. I can't remember which one, but wow. Yeah, toward, towards the end of the season, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Stroll's a funny one again. You know, he's so up and down. It, it, it's tricky... Having a teammate who's performing as well as Alonso. Nah. But even then, you know, Stroll, again, wasn't able to really do as much with the Aston Martin as he should have done. He had some good races. You know, he, 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 had, a, he had a couple of really strong races, uh, include well, gee, the race Abu Dhabi or the one before that where he... Uh, I think you're right. Uh, no, had a very strong run up the field, yeah. which was not long after he'd been looking very depressed about being in the sport and very miserable. I keep wondering, you know, how long he's going to stick with it or how long Aston going to stick with him, presumably as long as he wants to, given he's strong junior. But it would be nice if he could either be a bit more consistent or maybe make way for somebody who'd do a better job with the car. Felipe Drugovic would be my choice. I think he's remarkably did well in the test recently and he did well when he did an Aston Martin test. He's a top man from F2. There are some great guys come up from F2. My biggest disappointment, I think, of the year was that... Logan Sargent? No, surprisingly, he kind of almost got there in the end. My biggest disappointment was the fact that Liam Lawson didn't get offered either an Alpha Tauri or a Red Bull drive oh. next year. I think he's a man to watch. I've said it before, he has a very special set of skills, Liam Lawson, and I want to see them. I really believe in Liam Lawson. Mm. I'm, I'm saying this now. I've said it before. What was your... Biggest disappointment, would you say, of the season? Was there a dull race that you remember or something that you hoped would happen and didn't happen? Um, biggest disappointment? I mean, I, I think generally the fact that Mercedes weren't able to do a better job through the season. Yeah. Probably that in terms of, you know, what I broadly expected for the season and how things worked out. Ditto Ferrari, you know, the fact that they've dropped the ball as many times as they did. They do tend to do that. That's a disappointment. Yeah. But other than that, I mean, no, I, I, it was a much more entertaining season than really I, I thought we were going to get. Uh, so, yeah, not, not too much disappointment. So, which was your favourite race of 2023? I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> you know me so well. <laughs> uh, no, my favourite race, unquestionably, Las Vegas. Yeah. Now... It helps that it actually was one of the best races. Correct, in fact. yeah. We had some really good racing action, which, given how anxious people were about whether the tyres were going to work in the conditions that were expected, there's a bit more of a story there that we talked about before, we won't go into it, temperatures, yada, 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 colder than they thought. Given that, we had a remarkably good race, and it, I think, proved all the doubters wrong. It was a risky bet for F1. They spent a lot of money. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars on setting up and promoting this race. And it could have gone bad in all kinds of ways. It did undoubtedly antagonise some locals, but on the whole, it was just a roaring success. You know, people loved it. It was a great spectacle. People are going to be anticipating next year rather than thinking, oh God, we've got to go and do this thing again. You know, watch this odd Las Vegas glitzy showbiz thing. It really worked. It absolutely worked. Everyone's going to be looking forward to it next year. 
yeah, so that was that was definitely my highlight of the year, my my race of the year. But it was also kind of a, it was it was, it's like a, a peak nonsense moment also because. Much as I love Las Vegas, I, I will go there any chance I get. It's a ridiculous place. It's absolutely absurd. It shouldn't exist. You shouldn't have. <laughs> there's, just, there's just no way anybody in their right mind would build a city of that size in the middle of a desert that far away from all of the stuff that you need. And then put a world championship motor race right down the high street. Well, yeah, and yeah, and then you take, <laughs> and then, and yeah, so, yeah, so it, it is one of the most absurd places in the world. And sport is really rather silly, and motorsport is probably sillier than most sport. And F1 is the silliest of all motorsports. It, it's the most ridiculous, the most expensive. So you're taking the most ridiculous motorsport and you're taking it to the most ridiculous place on earth. Oh, wow, wow. Hey, and boy, and boy, did it work. Um, what do I always like to say? What's wrong with silly? I'm often silly myself. And I, what's wrong with a bit of silly? It's good. My favourite yeah. race of the year was Singapore. I love Las Vegas. It was really close. But the way that the last few laps played out in Singapore with Carlos Sainz winning and that chase for the line between Lando, oh, well, in order, Carlos... Lewis, Lando, and George Russell, and then George binning it, going, you know, hitting the wall and going down the side, oh, messing it up at the wrong moment. Oh, that was heartbreaking. Often the great races aren't just about the great moments, they're also about the most tragic moments as well. And I really felt that George was doing brilliantly there and, you know, Lost it. Poor old George. I feel for him. Yeah. He said not only the worst Formula One season, the worst motor racing season he's ever had in all the formulas he's raced in. Poor George. Mm. Okay. So that's it for 2023. We bid you adieu and merci because, you know, uh, Formula One Grand revoir. Prix is French, right? Uh, so we uh, adieu. Uh, oui, absolument. Two questions about 2024. First of all, the first race starts in Bahrain on March the 2nd. The last one is in Abu Dhabi on the 8th of December. We will have 24 races and probably six sprints, right? Which, again, is too much Formula One. As much as I love Formula One, it's a bit too much. Now, what do you want to happen in 2024? And what do you think will happen? <clears throat> what I want to happen is for there to be a thrilling season-long battle between Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, Lando Norris. I, I can't wish for more than that. Yeah. I think I've got, I've, 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 I've got to cut it off there. Yeah. I want them to have a meaningful battle for at least half the season and maybe then for it to, to kind of, you know, condense down, distill down to the essence of, of two of them fighting it out for the rest of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I care that much who the two are, you know. Mm. Yeah, that's what I want to see. You don't want it to be a, a, a fait accompli halfway through the season, which it kind of more or less was this year. Yeah, I think I'm with you, Z. I want it to go right to the line. I want it to be decided in the last race between two contenders. But in the penultimate race, I want there to be three or four possible contenders or three contenders mathematically oh, yeah, yeah yeah you know so it sort of filters down right until the end okay that's what you want to happen what do you think is going to happen i think max and red bull are going to be very strong again next year and everyone else is still going to be running to catch up yeah that's what i expect and in a sense my more my more realistic hope is just that a stronger challenge to Max, yeah, you know, comes out of the remaining teams. Yeah, you know, whether it's McLaren, Ferrari, Mercedes, I'm not quite sure. I, th I I think it will be McLaren, but we'll see. There are almost no changes between this season and next season in terms of rules. In fact, for the first time... And in terms of drivers it, also, actually, the very little... Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. It, it, for the first time in the history of Formula One since, what, 1951, there are no driver changes between consecutive seasons. Wow. The minor changes that are coming. Apparently, teams will be allowed to install an aero scoop 
to the car to aid driver cooling. This is from the experiences of Qatar this year, which absolutely demolished the drivers. Do you remember? I think it was yeah, Oscar yeah, yeah. Piastri lying on the floor in the cool down room who was absolutely beaten by the heat. And that's a kind of a health worry. So they're working on that. That's the one change. The tyre warmer ban, which they were going to progressively bring in 2023 and then put in 2024, that's gone away as well. Alfa Romeo are gone. Sauber are back. Alfa Romeo might be going to the WEC, from what I heard. And there's some talk that Alfa Romeo will do a deal with their Stellantis stablemate, Peugeot. I can't imagine Alfa Romeo running a car that's essentially a Peugeot in the WEC. That, that sounds weird to me, but that's the latest thinking. No, intriguing. Yeah, that would be an odd type. Uh, yeah, I don't Peugeot, believe it. I, I can't Romeo, see it happening. Mm. But yeah. If Alpha do go to the WEC, they'll need an entire chassis of their own, in, in my opinion. Judging from what they say, they don't want to be sticking their label on a car. They want to have control over the team, so we'll say. Yep, like I said, Sauber are back. I think they're going to dribble down absolutely behind Haas and have a shocking season next year. Mind you, you'd have a hard time having a worse season than Haas, yeah. had, surely. I mean, you know, they yeah. they really sucked this year. It's yeah. <laughs> unfortunate to say, but they they really did. Yeah. It was also a shame that, I mean, I mean uh, Kevin Magnussen didn't have a great season, you know, really not a very good car, you know, but even that he didn't do as well relative to Hulkenberg than he, he should have done. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, it, it's a shame. I mean, I really, you know, I, I uh, like Kevin Magnussen. It was great having him turn to the sport. And it's a shame that this was a rather disappointing showing. Yeah. And I, I, actually, given Haas performances, it, it, it's interesting that they've actually hung on to, to both of their drivers. Mm hmm. Well, you Hulk know. has proved that the Haas is. Very useful in qualifying. He was often in the top six in qualifying, which is an exceptional thing. But then the car simply doesn't work in the race. It uses up all its tyre grip earlier on. And when it hasn't got maximum grip from the tyres, the car just falls apart. So they're clearly not completely understanding that car. Okay, coming to my hopes and predictions for next year. My hope is that Lewis gets his eighth championship. That's what I want. My prediction is it ain't going to happen. I think, like you said, Zarg, Red Bull have got a complete understanding of these new rules at the moment. And they will once again build on a car which is already the best by some margin and be able to either maintain that gap, despite the fact that winning the championship means they will get, is it? two days less aero time there's something like that the rules now the how you finish up in the championship the less yeah, yeah. aero time you get and maybe cfd time as well i'm not sure but what i want to happen is for lewis to win what i think will happen is that red bull will win the championship again and it will be max but ferrari in my opinion as you suggested before will win more than one race possibly three races next year maybe mclaren will win and the, the reason i think ferrari will win is that they seem to understand their car they are consistent throughout the year ferrari always finish more or less the same place on the grid which means that they understand the car they've just got to better understand and these are the people who understand the car are the teams who are going to perform better next year the teams who are up and down the grid don't fully understand the car and that includes McLaren, who have done incredible things this year, and it includes Aston Martin, who I think got lucky with their car this year. I can't believe that they delivered a car as good as they did by design. I think it was, oh my God, that works. Everyone else is messed up. And they were flattered by the lack of performance by Mercedes and even Alpine, you know, who should be up there. So what do I think will happen? Max will win again. Uh, pff, what else do I want to happen? I want to see Piastri win a race. He won a sprint this year, but I think he's really pushing Lando. And I'm a big Lando fan like you. Lando's amazing. But I think the difference between Lando and Piastri in his first season is, you know, closer than a... A, 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 a cigarette paper, a West cigarette paper, if I can stay with McLaren sponsors. Do you agree? Is Lando going to better Piastri uh, next year? 
Probably, but Piastri is incredible. I mean, he's yeah. exceeded, I think, uh, he must have exceeded whatever expectations McLaren had for him and he's exceeded the expectations of commentators and, and fans. He's been fantastic. He's been extraordinary. But yeah, Lando is a very, very talented driver and he will be hard to beat. So I, I think that I, I think that's going to be close. And it was, it's, well, it's going to tell us, it's going to be quite revealing of just how good Piastri is, how the two of them do next year. But speaking of drivers and what we're expecting, particular drivers, quick mention for Albon, because Alex Albon had a fantastic year yeah. uh, with Williams. It's a shame Sargent didn't do better, which actually would have made it perhaps a bit easier to judge just how well or not Albon has been doing. But after you know many years of Williams really struggling and not having many good stories to tell, Alex Albon coming back to the sport and stepping into the, the Williams, he's been really really good. He's delivered some terrific results for them. They've been scoring points and doing better in the championship than they would have expected. Let's hope that story continues next year and Albon continues to bring them more success onwards and upwards for that combo. Fingers crossed. Who is your star of the 2023 F1 season and why? Actually, I... I love the long pause, giving it real thought. I love this. (laughs) <laughs> okay, two answers. Uh, first of all, I guess serious answer, Piastri. I mean, he's just been mm-hmm. fantastic. Mm-hmm. Come in and in his rookie season has... Matched one of the best. If the car had doors, he would have blown them off. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> fantastic. So, um, yeah, so Piastri. But actually also, maybe... Um, after that last race of the season, Sonoda, in my mind, okay. is was a bit of a star. You know, he was ter- he was spectacular. He was great at that last race. Star of the end of the season, I'm going to say Sonoda because I loved his showing in Abu Dhabi. Got a lot of affection for him. And let's have a dark horse in this category, Sonoda. Okay, to wrap this up, my star of the season, and I think you're going to be surprised what I'm going to say. Go on. Is Wolverine. Logan Sargent. Okay. Because... Justify this. Yeah, well, he really struggled. He really struggled in his debut season. But his performances did consistently improve, which shows he has the ability beyond his natural abilities to improve. So much so that Williams re-signed him for next year in the face of some... Massive competition. There could have been any number of four drivers who would be a better choice than him, you might argue, to take that drive. But Logan did just enough to hang on. He'll get a win next year. I am kidding. (laughs) But I loved him. I think he reminds me of Damon Hill. Damon Hill was no great natural talent, but he improved himself and became consistent and that's what we've seen with Logan this year respect and we need an American driver in F1 anyway don't we with three races there every year Uh, yeah we do yeah we do that's it Zogger thank you very much indeed I'll see you in a week's time brother yeah I'll see you then absolutely looking forward to it and prepare your Christmas questions for the quiz eh will do say goodbye everyone goodbye everyone (laughs) goodbye everyone see you in a week bye bye For information on how to contact the show, see pictures, get song lyrics, follow us on Twitter, find our Facebook fan page, or to sponsor the show, go to GarethJones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Whiz Bang. Gareth Jones on Speed! Speed!